BBC 10 o'clock news on BBC One with Michelle Hussein. More than 100 people are reported to have been killed across Syria in a crackdown on anti-government protesters. The violence makes it one of the deadliest days since the uprising began. Britain calls it an assault on the Syrian people. Edging towards a deal on America's debt crisis, politicians in Washington say an agreement is now very close. Here, a political row on health spending. The government denies Labour claims that reforms will mean poorer areas lose out. And Ian Bell scores 159 for England after a controversial reprieve in the second test against India. Good evening. More than 100 people are reported to have been killed across Syria in one of the bloodiest days since the anti-government uprising began there in March. In one city, hospitals are said to have been flooded with casualties as tanks opened fire on protesters. Both Britain and the United States have condemned the violence. President Obama says he's appalled at the brutality of the Syrian government against its own people in Hama. Our World Affairs correspondent Caroline Hawley reports. The assault began at dawn, filmed by protesters who want the world to see what the regime is doing. They say that this morning, parts of Hama were like a war zone. Witnesses describe tanks smashing through makeshift roadblocks put up to stop their advance, firing indiscriminately. Hama has seen some of Syria's biggest demonstrations and it had been ringed by the military for weeks before, on the eve of the holy month of Ramadan, the troops moved in. We start hearing some artillery shoots from four uh, directions, artillery and uh, bombing, tanker bombing, and sometimes we hear uh, like uh, anti-aircraft shoots against people. Here, under fire, an attempt to rescue an injured man. <laughs> Hospitals were swamped. Doctors appealed for blood. All this in a city still scarred by memories of a massacre in 1982, in which tens of thousands of people were killed when an uprising by Islamists was suppressed. <laughs> President Obama and William Hague both said they were appalled by today's storming of Hama. The US now vowing to further isolate the Syrian regime. The uprising in Syria began four and a half months ago. Even before today, well over 1,500 civilians have been killed, as well as hundreds of security forces. More than 12,000 people have been arrested. But for all the force the regime has used, it's been unable to crush the protest movement. There's really no prospect of outright victory for either side in any of this. Ramadan has opportunities for the protesters to gather against the government, but the government also has a ruthless willingness to use all of its force inside these cities. And I think um, the most likely outcome is the protesters will eventually arm themselves, just like they did in Libya. Bashar al-Assad, who took over from his father Hafez 11 years ago, has made promises of reforms, but they've rung hollow, drowned out by the sound of his regime's guns. This has been one of the bloodiest days since the uprising began, the violence not confined to Hama. The authorities and the protesters in a deadly test of wills for the future of Syria. Caroline Hawley, BBC News. In the United States, politicians now appear to be close to a deal to resolve the deadlock over raising the government's borrowing limit. Democrats and Republicans have until Tuesday to reach an agreement or risk America not being able to pay its bills. Our North America editor, Mark Mardell, is in Washington tonight. Mark? We've just heard from the Democratic leader in the Senate that he hopes that a first vote on the new package can come tonight. So they're that close to an agreement. But just because the top political leaders of both parties can reach an agreement doesn't mean that they can sell it to their members in the Senate and the House of Representatives. This Sunday, the final showdown over the debt ceiling. There may be, may be a deal. With time running out to forge a deal, perhaps some cause for optimism. 
Reality TV and the Raw, a last-minute deal just might prevent a Washington drama turning into a world crisis. The president, his party leaders and top Republicans close to an agreement that's the talk of all the Sunday shows. Back in April, the president was asking us to raise the debt ceiling with no spending reductions at all. Now I think the uh, potential agreement that you just outlined is within our reach. Uh, we, we will avoid default. The deal would raise the debt ceiling, allowing America to borrow $2.4 trillion more than it can at the moment. That would be balanced by $3 trillion worth of cuts, some spelt out now, some decided in November by a special committee. If they couldn't agree, there'd be automatic cuts to the defence budget and medical care for the elderly. We're going to get a deal? Hope so. Senior politicians have been up on Capitol Hill working through the weekend as Washington is gripped by a suffocating heat wave, an agreement tantalizingly close. There are lots of details that haven't been worked out. There has been no sign off by any of the four leaders of the House or Senate. And uh, so we just have to keep working. Um, but uh, I do feel better today <laughs> about the ability to avoid default than I felt yesterday. The tempo is finally picking up, but for weeks, politicians have moved to a rather leisurely rhythm. Americans trying to keep cool down by the Washington waterfront would like their representatives to sweat a little more. It's gone on for way too long, and there's no reason to push it into the future. Let's get it done. We're taking our sweet old time, and it's not, it's not very impressive for the rest of the world. It's kind of embarrassing, actually. But don't expect a speedy race to the finish. Even if the top politicians agree a deal, it still has to be sold to their troops. And that is going to be difficult because many Democrats will think these cuts are far too deep and hurt programs they think are necessary. And probably more importantly, Republicans, particularly those backed by the Conservative Tea Party movement, don't think the cuts are deep enough. They distrust the whole mechanism. And some even say, look, when the problem is that you're deep in debt, what you don't do is borrow more money. They don't think the debt ceiling should be raised at all. So it's far from over. Mark, thank you. Mark Mardell, our North America editor in Washington. Well, here, the Chief Secretary to the Treasury has dismissed calls to scrap the 50% tax rate for top earners. Both the Mayor of London, Boris Johnson, and the former Chancellor, Lord Lamont, have said the rate should be cut to make the UK more competitive. But Danny Alexander today called that a cloud cuckoo land idea. We set out in the coalition agreement, and it's something that we as Liberal Democrats pushed very hard for, that the government's first priority in tax reductions would be tax cuts for people on low and middle incomes, those very families who are working hard to try and uh, make ends meet. And, you know, I think anyone who thinks that we're going to shift our priority to reducing the tax bur burden for the wealthiest has got another thing coming. That cannot be the right priority for a country at this time. A political row has broken out over health funding in England, with Labour claiming that poorer areas will lose out to more affluent ones as a result of spending reforms. The Health Secretary has rejected the claims and says that the NHS budget is increasing in every primary care trust in England. Our political correspondent Ian Watson explains. The Health Secretary must be getting a bit sick of all the criticism. Doctors, nurses and even some government ministers pushed for a rethink on his reforms. Now Labour are claiming that a change in the way the NHS is funded in England will harm the poor and help the rich. Using figures calculated by public health bodies in Manchester, Labour say less well-off parts of England, not just Manchester, but Liverpool and Tower Hamlets in East London, will lose out when funds are allocated, while richer areas such as Surrey and Hampshire will benefit. The government is not taking into account health inequalities as it used to do in allocating money. And inevitably, if you don't take health, into, health inequalities into account sufficiently, poorer areas lose money. Labour believe the government are vulnerable on the NHS. The health secretaries had to delay or change some of the big reforms it planned to the service in England. Now, Andrew Lansley knows if he wants to stage a political recovery, he can't take the latest criticisms lying down. We are increasing the budget in England. Everywhere in England is seeing a budget increase of at least 2.5%, most 3% plus. And we are making sure that we build from a position of better performance. So although the way money is being handed out within the NHS is changing, the overall amount in every part of England is going up. The NHS Primary Care Trust in less well-off Tower Hamlets will see an increase in its funding, which is very similar to the rise in better-off Surrey this year. 
and in future, the government say local authorities will get more money to help improve the health of people living in deprived areas. The health secretary will try to push through much bigger changes to the NHS in the autumn. These will be examined closely by the opposition and by professional bodies who are still worried that the government's reforms could make the health service worse, not better. Ian Watson, BBC News. A 59-year-old man who died after his plane crashed in Salford on Friday has been named as Ian Daglish. Another man remains in a critical condition in hospital following the crash. Both men were injured when their light aircraft crashed onto homes in the Peel Green area. Some universities in England could find themselves under pressure to offer lower fees for brighter students from next year, according to a leading vice-chancellor. The outgoing president of Universities UK, Sir Steve Smith, said some institutions would risk losing funding if they didn't compete harder for the best performers. Aid agencies say that the famine crisis in Somalia is becoming increasingly desperate with a dramatic rise in people suffering from malnutrition. 10,000 are already estimated to have died and Islamist militias have hampered efforts to get aid to some of the worst affected areas. From the capital Mogadishu, Andrew Harding sent this report. Guns and hunger in Mogadishu today. Surrounded by armed guards, we've come to the front lines in Somalia to see the impact of the famine. First, some good news. Food aid is trickling in here now. These United Nations supplies distributed by local organizations which know their way around the war zone. But aid is still not getting to where it's needed most. Three-year-old Gedo is in a critical condition. His family has just escaped from territory controlled by Al-Shabaab, the militant Islamist group that still won't accept UN food in bulk. Most here have similar stories. You can say that maybe 50% of the, of the children in here, or more than that, they, are, they have severe acute malnutrition. And just a few city blocks away, Mogadishu's long war grinds on. These African Union peacekeepers trying to push Al-Shabaab out of the capital. It's a tough environment in which to try to end a famine. Tight security around the camp here and really very difficult uh, conditions for the families here. You can see these little tents that they've put up, makeshift tents. There are about 30,000 people here now and uh, we understand 200 more arriving every day from the center of Somalia looking for food and looking for safety. But this ruined city is not much of a haven and Somalia's emergency has yet to reach its peak. Andrew Harding, BBC News, Mogadishu. And now with today's sport, here's Ollie Foster. Hi, Ollie. Thank you very much indeed, Michelle. Hello there. With two days left to play in the second test, England lead India by a massive 374 runs. 159 of them came from Ian Bell in the second innings, but he was involved in a very controversial incident at Trent Bridge today. He was given out, but then reinstated after tea. Here's Patrick Geary. With the match now charging towards a climax, England's batsmen needed to set the pace. Andrew Strauss was perhaps too eager, chasing one from Srisanth with his team still in arrears. Ian Bell was flying along though, bright and breezy from the off, seemingly free from pressure. He rapidly moved his side into the lead and himself to a crafted 50. After the interval, Kevin Peterson picked up the baton and battered the Indian attack. Terrific shot. As he crashed onto 50, Bell caressed his way to a fine century, among the best of the 15 he scored at test level. Peterson eventually went, but England almost survived further loss up to T until a bizarre and unsavoury incident. Owen Morgan assumed he had four runs, but actually the ball was not dead. India removed the bales with Ian Bell departing for tea. In fact, he was departing run out to his, his team's and the home crowd's consternation. But peace broke out over the crumpets as Bell re-emerged, India's appeal withdrawn. And so they carried on, Morgan returning to form with 50, Bell onto 150 before finally being given permanently out. 
Morgan and Trot followed him, but as so often, Matt Pryor restored momentum. England are now in command of the test. Patrick Geary, BBC News. Jensen Button was given a cake ahead of his 200th Grand Prix and he got a big bottle of champagne in Hungary today. After winning it, his McLaren teammate, Lewis Hamilton, was heading for victory, but he was penalised by the stewards for dangerous driving and he could only finish fourth. The wisdom inside that helmet that comes from 11 years in Formula One served Jensen Button very well today. He won his first Grand Prix in Hungary five years ago. That was also in the wet. And from the very start, he was all over his teammate, Lewis Hamilton. Both the McLaren drivers were catching Sebastian Vettel. The Germans' lead from pole lasted just five laps. Hamilton passed first. Button got his strategy spot on, an early stop, fresher tyres, and Vettel watched him slip through as well. But there was still a long way to go. Anything could happen, as Nick Heidfeld found out. Hamilton was feeling the heat as well. He lost control and the lead. And as he spun his car back in the right direction, he almost caused an accident. The stewards' view of that would cost him the race. He didn't find out for a few laps, though. But Button takes the lead of the Grand Prix yet again. Enough time to go wheel to wheel with Button for the lead. No team orders here, just great racing. Until the stewards handed down their punishment for that spin. Brother Nick watched Hamilton take his drive-through penalty. The race was Button's, only his 11th in those 11 years. But it may be an important one. Guys, perfect going into the summer break. Let's come back and win them all. Button's win puts him firmly in the chasing pack, but Vettel's second place still sees him stretch his championship lead. Great Britain's swimmers have signed off from the World Championships in Shanghai with another gold medal. Liam Tancock successfully defended his 50 metres backstroke title, taking the team's tally of golds to three for the championships. Only two have come in the pool, though. Hannah Miley also won silver today in the 400 metres medley. Golf and Englishman Simon Dyson has won the Irish Open and the Women's British Open went to the world number one and defending champion Yanni Tseng from Taiwan. She finished on 16 under par at Carnoustie, four clear of the field. It's her fifth major title for the 22-year-old. Scotland's Katrina Matthew finished joint fifth. And that is all your sport. Ollie, Michelle. thank you. And in fact, that's it from us. You can see more on all of today's stories on the News Channel, now on BBC One. Time for the news where you are. From me, good night. Hello and good evening from Look North. The Muslim community in York says it's shocked at the hundreds of racist remarks that have been made about plans to build a new mosque. The York Mosque and Islamic Centre has submitted plans to the council to replace its current building. Now a petition's been launched against the move. Nicola Reese has our main report. <laughs> A special prayer session takes place at the York Mosque to mark the start of the holy month of Ramadan. From the outside, it doesn't look much like a place of worship, but more than 400 people regularly use this mosque, and most agree it's no longer fit for purpose. That building over there is it's only a portal cabin, it's only a temporary building, you know. Everybody squeezing to each other, and uh, sometimes there is no room. So plans have been put to the council to build a new mosque on this site, and one that would look more like a mosque with a small dome and two minarets. But soon after those plans were submitted, this popped up on the internet. It's a petition against the new mosque, and it's already got around 500 signatures. But most of the people who've signed it don't live in York, and many of the comments are racist. So this one here says they preach hate and death no more mosques a little bit further down and there's another one that says mosques spread poison and hatred say no to the mosques now many of the others are just too offensive to read and we believe that the person who set this petition up is also a member of the far right group the EDL why are they objecting to us having uh, new facilities, improved facilities. And I think it is a platform, that a petition is a platform from Islamophobia. It's because they don't actually understand Islam. They think Islam is all to do with terrorism, bombing, etc. Praying B is 50p. For now, the fundraising for the new mosque continues. According to York Council, only four planning objections have been received. Nicola Rees, BBC Look North in York.
The Sheffield United player Ched Evans has been charged with rape following an alleged incident in Wales in May. The 22-year-old striker seen on the right will appear before Prestatyn magistrates in August. In a statement, he said he was shocked and disappointed. Rugby League had a dramatic week for Wakefield, ended in a heavy defeat against Crusaders. They may have won in the Super League licence stakes, but the Crusaders had a point to prove. Final score, Wakefield 6, Crusaders 40. And two other results to tell you about tonight, and that was Bradford 6, Warrington 64, Castleford 46, St Helens 26. And you can, of course, see all the action on the Super League show at 11.25 tonight. In cricket, Yorkshire's trip to Holland ended in a shock defeat in the Clydesdale Bank 40. The Tykes were bowled out for just 123, Adil Rashid top scoring, and the Netherlands won by four wickets, knocking off the required runs with 12 overs remaining. Now, the Jane Tomlinson Run for All took place in York today. Over 5,000 runners tackled the 10K court.